Simon Says on the Mark. I'm Russell Simon, and we have a jam-packed show for you today, including an interview with CHS linebacker Matt McGriff as we look back on another successful year of CHS football. And I'm Mark Donatelli. Also on this edition, we look at some of the best and worst in sports today. We also take a look at whether there should be a playoff system allowed in the NCAA, and whether it's teams like Boise State and TCU should buy for the national championship. And now for our high school sports story. The CHS football team has had one of their best seasons in recent memory, going undefeated in the regular season and earning a home playoff game. The Cougars faced a very strong Bridgewater Raritan team and lost 27-7, ending their season for the second straight year in the first round of the state playoffs. Here to recap the season, we have senior linebacker, fullback, and captain Matt McGriff in the studio. Thanks, Matt, for joining us. It's a pleasure being here. Matt, let's go back four years. You're a freshman. You're coming into uh, CHS. They're winless in the past two seasons. Could you predict that you'd finish your career with two playoff appearances? Well, you never know what to expect, but when you got a new coach, I was Curtin's second or first year coming in. I, wasn't, I didn't know what was going on. I was just a freshman, just had my pads on and my helmet on. I just strapped up and just playing ball just to keep me out of trouble after school. There you go. Now, coming off with the winning season last year, where the Cougars flew under the radar for the first month of the season, and then this year, where the expectations were higher, and you still started off strong, easily beating Eastside and Kearney. Did you expect to start off as strong as you did coming off of last season? Well, I came in with short goals, as in, uh -huh. you know, stay healthy, don't be embarrassed by having a bad team or something like that. Yeah. And I didn't really expect, like, a 9-1 a in one season. Mm -hmm but I just expected to play hard and just play with pride because, you know, we lost all our defensive start. I was the only returning yeah. starting player on defense, so we didn't know really what to expect. And I guess Kearney, our first game of the season, we came out firing and we beat them. I can't remember the score off the top of my head, but we, we got them pretty good. And after that, we were just like, yeah, we're used to this. Definitely we're got used the to confidence. Role. Yeah. Uh, Matt, you, Jordan Davis, Odelson Julian, and Denzel Nieves were elected the captains this year by the team, including me. Um, how, how do you embrace the responsibility of leading a team on another playoff run? It was easy because I knew I had the support of my players and from the team, from my other coaches. And for the other captains, we all had our own little meeting. We all went out one day and we talked about the responsibilities that we had to do and what we had to take care of and how we know like, to not let other players see us down because they look up to on a certain, mm -hmm. on a certain situation. So we took that very seriously and we understood the job that we had to get done. Now you finished the regular season 8 now, which was the first since 1951, and something last year's team didn't even accomplish. How did that affect your confidence going into what you knew would be a tough playoff game, even though it was at home? Well, I didn't really look at our record to, to you know, to like soup ourselves up for mm -hmm. what's going on. We knew Bridgewater was a good team. Yeah. We know their, st their style of football, their caliber was, was different from the ones we play, mm -hmm. but we weren't going to back down or anything. Yeah. You know, we knew they played teams like Immaculata and Franklin, and we played maybe not the as bigger teams as them, but, you know, with the 8-0 eight, eight record, like, what could you expect, you know? Exactly. We've beaten everybody that are on our schedule. We can't help who's on our schedule. Mm -hmm. So week in, week out. Um, the Cougars lost 27-7 to in the first round of the playoffs, but you knew the annual uh, Thanksgiving game coming, you know, was coming up against Irvington. Was the intensity any less coming to that game, knew, knowing that you were out of the playoffs? Or, or were you handling it just like you were the past 10 games? It was hard getting over Bridgewater. We had some issues within, as you know, issues within the team, as in if players wanted to come back. And, you know, we had slouches like that. But we all got together. Coaches did a fabulous job with getting us back in the, the great mind, like the mindset of getting back in the winning season. So we understood that Irvington was, yeah, they're in a higher division than us. And everybody says, hey, can we play with the higher division? Hmm. So we wanted to look at that as a, yeah, we can play with them. We have to get this win. And for the returning players, as in, you know, you and the other guys, we have to get back on the winning track so we can't lose two games in a row. Yeah. And it definitely shows on your leadership that you were able to get them pumped up for that game. Definitely. Now, Matt, you're a two-sports star playing varsity baseball as well. Do you think the tough losses in football and also in baseball last year, I know the GNT finals at mm -hmm. Bears and Eagles, Riverfront Stadium was a close game that we lost. Mm -hmm. And Do you think it will help you to be ready for the big games to come this season in baseball, maybe, you know, beat Seton Hall prep for the second year in a row? Definitely. You know, That'd be nice. We always think about how you, like, you always figure out what kind of play you are when you're faced with adversity, you mm -hmm. know. Last year, you know, we were down 10, and we came back to beat them in the first inning. 
you know, football, we were always down. Nutley, we were down. Bridgewater, we were down, but we couldn't get out of that. But we now have been in situations like that. GNT, we were, oh, we were down monthly game, and we battled back. So games like that, you understand what you have to do in certain situations to get the job done. It's not always a grand slam, but maybe it's a bunt single or, mm -hmm. you know, a hit and run here or there to get the job done. All right, Matt, thanks a lot. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, Matt McGriff, senior Columbia High School football captain and baseball captain, possibly. Mm -hmm. Matt, thanks a lot for joining us. Good luck the rest of the year. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. All right, now moving on to professional sports, it's time to take a look at our quick hits, where we talk about some of the most current news of the day in sports. Mark? Uh, Russell, I hate to throw another Jets-related question at you, but, I mean... The past few games, especially the Lions, the Browns, the Texans, they just been ridiculous. Uh, what can you contribute the winning to? I mean, they just come out there and they win these crazy games. I mean, you look at the Texans, a last-second win from San Antonio Holmes. The Lions, where they basically underperformed the entire game and then just find a way to get it done. The Browns, where they get another touchdown from San Antonio Holmes right at the end of overtime. I mean, they are resilient. They find ways to win. They're a good team, they're 9-2, and two. they're getting it done, and it also reflects back on Sanchez. Mark Sanchez has been very impressive. He's thrown for 336, 299, and 315 yards the past three weeks. San Antonio Holmes has 22 receptions, 447 yards, and four touchdowns. He's been very impressive. But if you want to look at the negatives for the Jets, I think it really comes down to the defense. Rex Ryan has always said, where the Jets play like a Jet, where you have to have a great defense. Last year, they definitely did, and they were able to carry them with all the I interceptions and miscues from Mark Sanchez. This year, Sanchez has been really solid, just like most of the offense has been, but the defense has just been mediocre. They've got 21 sacks. They're letting teams stay in the game. They really can't pressure the quarterback, and that's letting, qu letting quarterbacks like um, Matthew Stafford, and Colt McCoy to an extent, come in, play well, get last minute touchdowns to keep them in the game, and making the offense win games. And this is something last year that the Jets did not have. The offense really never had to go out and win the game. This year it's already happened five times. Now on to hockey, Steve Stamkos of the Tampa Bay Lightning is having one of the best starts since Wayne Gretzky in 1981, and that's saying something. He's got 21 goals in 24 games. Can Stamkos go 50 and 50? Uh, I mean, he's, he's really just has been unbelievable. I mean, he's turned into the, the face of that Tampa Bay franchise. Definitely. I mean, it, it's, look, it's hard to replicate what Gretzky did in 1981. He had 92 goals, 100 and, 120 assists. If you wow. can believe that. I mean, that's a, I mean know, people, hard to beat that. The best players in the league don't even get 100 points in a, in a year. I mean, he's, right now, he's on pace for 72 goals to finish the year, which is outstanding nowadays with better goaltending. I mean, he's just really, he's just turned into one of the best overall players in the league. I mean, I'd be completely shocked if he didn't win the, the MVP, the Hart Trophy mm -hmm. in the NHL. I mean, he, he really is maybe the best player in the league now. And, and 50 for 50 would just be another unbelievable thing that he could pull off. And you look at some of the premier players with the big names. You look at Alex Ovechkin, Sidney Crosby, and Stamkos could be making a name for himself in a market where hockey is not really the main thing. You look at Pittsburgh, other than the Steelers, mm -hmm. you know, it's basically hockey. Capitals also in Washington, very big there. Buffalo. And Buffalo, <laughs> of course. Got to give it to Buffalo. Yeah. And, you know, you look at Tampa Bay. They won the Stanley Cup a couple years back in the early 2000s, and now with Stamkos, it looks like they can kind of rejuvenate hockey in an area where it's, you know, not as big a focus as it is up north. Definitely. General Manager Steve Eisenman is really doing a good job with uh, that team in his first year. Mm -hmm. um, Russell, with another win this past Thursday, this time in Detroit, the Patriots have improved to 9-2 on the season, and they're still undefeated at home. Are they the team to beat in the AFC, or if not, who is? Well, as much as I'd like to say the Jets, I think right now the New England Patriots are far and away the best team in the NFL and are certainly the team to beat. You look at New England, they've beaten the Steelers and the Colts. Brady is just outstanding. I said he was my MVP pick last show. He's got 19 touchdowns, 4 interceptions, 2,362 yards, and a 100 quarterback rating. That's incredible. 
And you look at some of these other quarterbacks, you know, they've got targets to throw to. You look at, I mean, Andre Johnson, a big target for the Texans, has helped them offensively stay in the game, but Tom Brady doesn't have that. I mean, Julian Edelman, sure. They traded Randy Moss. He's now on the Titans. And, you know, he's just not, you know, he doesn't have the targets, but he still makes it work. Edelman's playing great and also has been the real shocking surprise of running back Danny Woodhead. 56 carries, 312 yards, and three touchdowns, including a great one against the Indianapolis Colts that helped really seal that game for them. He's been very impressive, and it's just a testament to how Brady can take players that aren't big names, they aren't really regarded as premier players, and make them good just from his presence. I think right now, with the teams they've beaten, they've got to be the team to beat. And that game next Monday night, Patriots and Jets will probably determine who's going to be the number one seed. It's going to be a good one. I like, I mean, the Patriots are just a very talented team right now. I mean, you really just summed up his career there. I mean, exactly. earlier in the decade, you know, Jabbar Gaffney at receiver, you know, Deion Branch, who's back now. I mean, he's really, he hasn't, you know, except for that 2007 season, you look what he did that year. Yeah. Uh, he really has never had reliable targets. And, you, and now you look at Branch coming back off nothing. I mean, he did nothing in Seattle. He comes back to New England, and then all of a sudden, it's like magic. He had a great touchdown last week against Detroit, and he just takes these players and just rejuvenates their careers, really. The Dallas Cowboys have won two of their last three and nearly beat New Orleans in an incredible Thanksgiving mm. game. We couldn't tear ourselves away from the TV when, th when dinner was ready. But since interim, Gar interim coach Jason Garrett has been promoted, there's been a huge change in Dallas. Why do you think that is? It's just been another, you know, cowboy drama this year, mm -hmm. just how it is every year. I mean, this is a team that was considered, you know, the first team ever, you know, to play a home, a home Super Bowl. This year will be in Dallas. It's really, it's just been chemistry issues. And, and when that happens, you've got to look at the top. You've got to look at who's coaching the team. Oh, Phillips had to uh, go. Phillips, you know, this was a guy that a lot of people thought would be fired last year, and it just never, it never came through. And, and finally, finally, they, they, they made the move that was needed to be done. And Definitely. It, it, shows what, it shows what happens. Uh, the Miami Heat have been surprisingly average this year. Uh, they're 10-8 they're and eight and struggling recently. They lost a buzzer beater to Memphis, Boston twice, and they're getting blown out by Indiana and Orlando. Are you surprised that they haven't dominated so far this year? I am surprised. When you look at some of these players, you've got LeBron, you've got Dwayne Wade. I mean, I just can't believe they haven't put it together. I mean, you look at Wade, 22.9 uh, points per game. That's down by almost 8 points. Only 3.5 assists. They don't have a point guard to help spread the ball around. I think it's just really three really weird pieces that don't fit together, and then you don't have the role players. You look at the Lakers, they've got Derek Fisher, they've got Paul Gasol, they've got Ron Artest. The Heat don't have any of that, and with Eric, Sp Eric Spolstra, I just don't see the leadership there. But I must say I am surprised. I mean, you look at this team, it's shocking that really? they have that record. It really is. I mean, I just can't even believe it, you know. Third place in their own division. They have the same record as the Atlanta Hawks. That's just, I mean, come on. Uh, Coach K made a good point in an interview with ESPN. He said, just because you're wearing a Heat uniform doesn't mean you're a team yet. Exactly. All right, we'll be right back. Once again, a reminder, everybody, check out the Simon Says on the Mark Facebook page at www.facebook.com slash Simon Says on the Mark. We'll be right back. After 17 years working as a mason, Mike was laid off. I met him when he came into the library looking for help. He found a job opening, but the application was only online. Mike said he'd spent his entire life around tools, but had never used a computer. I showed him how, and he ended up applying for numerous jobs online. I saw Mike the other day. His new computer skills paid off. He's working again. New Jersey libraries are transforming lives. Tell us your story. Welcome back to Simon Says on the Mark. It's time for our sports awards segment where we talk about the best and, wor and worst in sports today. Mark, the holidays are right around the corner. Corner Hanukkah started, uh, I believe, last night. And my birthday, of course, December 23rd, right before Christmas. So 
Let's talk, what do you think, your favorite sports holiday? I'm going to go with probably the obvious one here, the Thanksgiving. I mean, it, you got the cold weather, you know, leaves are falling, maybe different parts of the country it's snowing. It's football weather. Mm -hmm. You know, you're Definitely. inside, there's the food and the oh. family. It's, it's the middle of the season, so, you know, even though you're watching a Detroit game, usually they're meaningful games for maybe the away team or Definitely. for the Cowboys. I mean, they're entertaining games usually, and I really like how the NFL Network added their Thursday night games to oh. that. Now it's three, so it's totally all day. Of course. You know, it's, it's a football holiday, you know, it's a football holiday now. And it's great just because, you know, you go in, you get your food, you eat, you know, and then right before dessert, you just watch the end of the game. Amazing. I must say, Thanksgiving is good, but it's not the best. I'm looking at a sport that is a holiday in itself. You look at the first week of March Madness for college basketball, this is hands down the best sports holiday. March Madness, first week, everyone gathers together. You've got 68 teams, epic upsets every year. Skip work, I remember last year, you want to talk about best sports holiday, Skip Jim, me and the teachers just sat in, like the, in the staff lounge and just watched the games for 45 minutes. Absolutely incredible. It's got to be the best sports holiday. Plus, you get to listen to Gus Johnson screaming whenever something exciting happens. Yeah, it definitely has turned into a holiday of its, of its own. Definitely. And now that you added teams and stuff. People really, you know, create their schedules around exactly. the tournament. I mean, I'm, I'm going to fill in ten brackets. It's amazing. <laughs> and, but Thanksgiving football, too, of course. Yeah, I don't really go that far. Maybe just one. All right. All right. Hey, okay. I know you did, too. Come on. Uh, well... One, really. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there you go then. All right, now, on a bit sadder note, sports in the New York area are generally pretty good, but there's been some disappointing teams. Mark, what's your most disappointing New York sports team? Hey, you said disappointing, not worst. So I'm <laughs> going with the Jersey Devils here. Oh, yes. Uh, now, they're not the worst team in the league. That would be the Islanders, who are also a metro area team, <laughs> but they don't hold the same standard that the Devils do. And, I mean, you look at this team this summer, the Kovalchuk situation, oh. you know, they really hurt the franchise. I mean, how many millions guaranteed or in, what, I, like a 12-year contract? I don't contract? even know, but it's a 12-year contract. Crazy. I mean, they really hurt the franchise by putting so much money into one player. But the thing is, they still have a lot of strong players. I know Parise is hurt, but they still have Langenbrunner. They still have Brodeur. I, you know, uh, Kovalchuk, obviously. I mean... It's it's really it's just amazing to me how how poorly they've played and I mean the defense has just been bad. There's a lot of pucks getting through and I mean maybe this wasn't their year, but it definitely could have been a solid year for them. A lot of good expectations for that team and they've just failed to live up to them. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean I know it's a new coach and all, but I mean they really when you have players like that, you yeah. should at least be you know eighth spot. All right now. The Devils are certainly very disappointing, but I look at a, a team basketball-wise where they could have had great expectations. They could have won the championship this year. You look at the New York Knicks and what could have happened. I know it's just a dagger in the heart of Knicks fans everywhere. They could have had LeBron. They could have had Carmelo, maybe Chris Paul. So much expectations. Maybe they'll get this player. Maybe they'll get this player. And in the end, they end up with Amari Stoudemire and nothing else. Raymond Felton, okay. Danilo Gallinari, .379 field goal percentage. Raymond Felton, lots of turnovers. They have two home wins. They have two wins in Madison Square Garden. That's just not going to get it done. And you look at, and this was a team with so much excitement. People were talking, LeBron, Chris Paul, Carmelo Anthony, and they get nothing. I mean, not even one of them. I mean, you know, LeBron, you know, they're 10 and 8 for the Heat, but still, you know, they had a chance to really get better. Uh, it could have been a lot of excitement, and it just never panned out. Big disappointment. Now, I know they didn't land any of those big three players you need. I mean, Stod I mean, Stoudemire is a strong player. You can't deny that. But it's, you're right, it's really not where the fans wanted it to go, and, I mean, who knows how much longer it'll take for the Knicks to finally step it up for it what their market demands. A playoff berth would be, a playoff win. And I don't know if Mike D'Antoni's the coach to do it. You know, I, I haven't been really satisfied with the job he's done. You know, you look at them, they have a lot of mediocre talent, and they just haven't really been able to kind of form together and make, you know, a great team that can grind out wins. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's really is a tough existence to be a Knicks fan. Oh, try being a Jets fan too. Or Every other year except for this one. The Bills. Oh, the Bills. <laughs> oh, we don't. Oh, the Bills. Hate to keep. All right, now, it. on the other side of the spectrum, the best winter team in New York. You got to give it to me. Come on. Uh, Come on all right. Say it. I'll take the say Jets. It. Yes. You I, just did, ladies and gentlemen. They're a very well-rounded team. I mean, that's that's obvious. But uh, their best attribute is just finding ways to win. They have a, a, the best, probably the best mixture of veteran players. LT, I mean, is, is really the big one to, to call out there. But, you know, you also got the young players. You exactly. also got Sanchez. Green, Sanchez. Sanchez, Green. I mean, it's, it really is a, like a, a good mixture. It's not too old like the Vikings last year, but it's not too young where you're, uh, what's going to happen when you get to the playoffs? And like I said, they find ways to win. And the reason I'm not taking the Giants is I, I just I feel that they're just – they're, they're a good team. I mean, they play in the NFC East. That's a very solid division. But I, I think they're a little too overrated. They turn the ball over more than any other team in the league. I'm taking the Jets just because they, they find ways to win. Please just keep going. It's music to my ears. Come on, please. What else that's, you got? That's, all I, can, that's all, right. all I can do. All right, maybe I'm being a homer, but the Jets are definitely the best winner sports team, if not the best team in New York right now. Nine and two on track for the Super Bowl. Big game against New England, but they find ways to win. They really find the heart and soul of the city. Of the city. You've got Rex Ryan. I, l I mean, I love it. Just It gets everyone energized. New stadium. Everyone's talking about the Jets, and it's for a good reason. They're 9-2. and two. They win these wild games. And you've got to be impressed with the job the Jets are doing right now, and they're definitely the best t winter team in New York, if not the best team in the NFL. Uh, I, you... It, to look at the Jets and, and you just see the mentality that they have going into every game, you know, coming from their owner down to the GM, exactly. Mike Tannenbaum, down, down to the coach, Rex Ryan. It's really just a winning mentality. Let's get it done now. And, and one that every fan would love to have for their team. Definitely. You got to love Rex. Got to love Rex. Uh, he's a bit of a loud mouth sometimes, you but think? I would take him. <laughs> of I would course. take him. Now, <laughs> now we look at college sports. It's been a good year for some coaches. Pete Carroll moving to the NFL from college. But it's been a disappointing year for some college coaches. What's your most disappointing college coach? Now, I like Greg Schiano. I think he has done wonders for Turned the Rutgers around. program. I mean, really, uh, this, this organization has just been completely turned around since he stepped in. He, he is a great recruiter. He might be one of the best in the country at bringing people into Rutgers. Guys from Florida, guys from all over the tri-state area, you know, really from anywhere on the East Coast. But he really, he's just not a good enough game coach. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. Yeah. And maybe you can't blame him for all the changes on the offensive side of the ball. Uh, Tom Savage has been disappointing coming into his sophomore year. A lot of people expected things from him. He hasn't turned out, you know, he hasn't lived up to the expectations. Um, Dodd has stepped in at quarterback, and he's solid, but, I mean, it's, it's not where they want to be. And exactly. His, his game-managing skills is just not up to par. If there was a GM in college football, he would be the, one of the best. All right. Well, I'm going to go down to Tennessee to find our most disappointing coach. You look at Tennessee basketball, Bruce Pearl just definitely a big disappointment. Suspended for half of the league season for violating NCAA rules and misleading investigators. He improperly hosted recruits and made excessive calls to recruits. I guess that's a bad thing, but it is disappointing. You look at a program like Tennessee, I mean they're storied, they're solid, you know, they're in the NCAA tournament every year making deep runs, Elite Eight last year. I mean this is just really a black eye for the program and a black eye for the university in general, you know. I mean, this is a coach. The coach is supposed to represent everything your university stands for. And when he's getting suspended for half the league seasons for doing this, it, I mean, it's just not good. And, you know, I mean, there's many other you can look at. You look oh, at yeah. Coach Kelly and Notre Dame. I mean, I think that's Rich pretty. Rich Rodriguez. Oh, yeah, Rich Rodriguez can't beat Ohio State. I mean, there's a lot of them, but I think Bruce Pearl, I mean, knowingly did it. You know, he basically took the rules and threw them out the window and said, come over, guys, let's watch some TV or whatever. Yeah. I, I, you know, it's just blatant disregard. He knew what he was doing was wrong, and, you know, he just did it anyway because he didn't care. And, you know, now he's getting caught, but, you know, I doubt if anything will change. It's, it's really been, it's been a tough decade for Tennessee. Oh, yeah. Lane Kiffin, the, that whole situation last year. 
you know, they thought they were getting, you know, a long-term answer for on the football side of the program. But it's it's really it really has been a disappointing decade for Tennessee. They haven't been definitely. the powerhouse that they they have been in the past. I mean, they definitely had some expectations, but you know, just really never lived up to them. You know, they could have won. They went to the Final Four. They could have stepped up, but just never made the final step. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's been tough. All right, now moving on to college football for our question of the day, Mark. College football has been racked by controversy in recent years about whether t about whether there should be a playoff and instead of having the BCS determine who plays in say the national championship game the top four teams actually play it out and this would definitely give teams like Boise State and TCU chances to play for the national championship where right now they won't. TCU's ranked third, Boise State's ranked 11th after losing to Nevada. What do you think? Should college football have a playoff system in place, uh, or I mean, should they just keep it the way it is? I, I have to say yes. I mean, it's there's there's every year there's there's teams that are undefeated. There's teams you know one or two losses, and who's to say that one deserves it over the other? I mean, it, it really isn't fair to say oh because this team is from this conference they deserve to make it over this team, and it, it really it's a disadvantage for the teams that aren't in the you know four or five major conferences. I mean, it definitely does, and there certainly should be a playoff system in place, but when they put one in, I think they need to make sure to not devalue the regular season. You look at the Iron Bowl last Saturday, Auburn inches out the 28-27 win. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that makes college football great. When they go out and, you know, these huge games, and every week is a playoff game. It's that kind of stuff that makes college football great. And I think if you put in a playoff system, some of that would be great. Some of that would be... Uh, take it away a little bit, you know. I don't know if Auburn's going as hard because they know that they're probably going to be in the top four anyway. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I'm not saying that it would devalue the regular season. It wouldn't be that long. I think the best answer would be just a quick, you know, three to four round bracket. You True. know, just quick. You know, the basic. You know, number one plays number sixteen. You know, it's it's just it's, it's a quick. Thing what if you just did the top four? I mean, you took Auburn, plays Stanford, Oregon plays TCU, and the winner goes to the national championship game. Exactly. I mean, it, it doesn't it doesn't have to yeah. be every year the major discussions between this undefeated team and that undefeated team. I think we should take this into the NCAA. While we do that, that's all the time we have left today. I'm Russell Simon. I'm Mark Donatelli. Thanks for watching, everybody. And remember to check out the Facebook page, friend us, we'll post questions, maybe you'll be on the show. We'll see you later, everybody.